are in listen-only mode. Hi, we're uh, just going to give it a minute or two uh, for more people to join before we get going. We're on two o'clock now. Um, we'll give it another moment. Is that the some final people filter through, and then we'll kick off. Okay, we'll get going. Um, so thanks for those that are joining and, and have already joined the webinar today. My name is Johnny Crawford. I'm head of sales here at Acorn IT, and I'm joined with uh, our business partner, Steve Jemmett. Um, so really what I want to do today is sort of to deliver a webinar is going to provide some value to, to your businesses. Okay, so manufacturing over the last decade, or so has seen rapid changes, uh, and more so with you know around technologies such as AI, handheld technologies, RPA, and the explosion of digital technologies that's certainly enabling human functions within within manufacturing to perform better. Um, the purpose of today's webinar is just to help your business through both growth and choosing the right technologies is going to help you scale and transform your business as the world as we know it continues with the digital evolution that the uh, recent pandemic and the pandemic that we're living in has has accelerated. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, today's uh, presentation is, is, is recorded and any questions you have can be uh, put in the questions and chat box which we'll deal with at the end. So we're just going to kick on to the agenda here. Uh, so Basically, uh, we're going to start by giving an overview of a bit, bit about Acorn uh, and on our relationship with Sage and the Sage ISV network. Um, before uh, go diving into you know, um, you know some of the tools that we we can um, show you, we're going to give you a high level overview of what's driving the you know transformation within manufacturing at the moment, and look at why choosing the correct you know, systems uh, for your business is critical for your business success. So we're going to go on and you know, look a bit about uh, Acorn here. Uh, so we've been in business for about 20 years now. Uh, we're an accredited award-winning uh, sales implementation and business partner. 
Uh, we provide bespoke and customised solutions developed both in-house and you know, utilising the SAGE ISV uh, partner network to really enhance you know, functionalities of um, you know, core, core financial packages. Okay. Uh, we've dealt with over 400 SAGE implementations under our belts uh, across the island of Ireland. Uh, with over 350 recurring customers across manufacturing, construction, professional services, wholesale and distribution, and, and other niche industries. With three offices across uh, County London Derry, Belfast, and Dublin. And I suppose our mission is to you know, really empower businesses to grow, be more agile, and drive process improvement. Uh, enabled by best in class business management solutions through the partnerships that we have. Um, so, a bit about Sage as a company, then, in case you don't know them, Sage are a Fuji 250 software company. They're arguably the number one uh, uh, accounting software business in the world, and they certainly sit within the top three ERP software companies in the world. And they're celebrating their 40th birthday this year uh, with over 13,000 employees, over 20 countries, and over 2 million uh, customers. And Sage's values lie in, in basically put, putting the customer first uh, and looking at how you know, AI and digital technologies can help empower businesses. So, very much aligning to our own, our, our own values there. So, just moving on, uh, you know. Really, what I want to speak about and just get to the crux of is, you know, manufacturing today in the UK and Ireland. Okay, so doesn't matter, you know, what area of manufacturing the sit you sit in. The pandemic has basically forced organisations across every manufacturing organisation to look at the way they do business different and become more agile and automated. Um, basically, uh, you know, surveys uh, out there are showing uh, at this point in time. There's 94% of manufacturers across the UK and Ireland that are just adjusting their business at the minute in new ways to achieve growth, having to become more agile and more automated, and uh, you know, adapt uh, and adapt to new ways of working. Now, let's shift. The automation is, is creating 97 million new jobs by 2025 and disrupting 85 million jobs uh, already in place. And, you know, it's going to af affect new areas and skills of what you need to have uh, at, at your disposal. You know, more analytical thinking, more creativity, and, and there's emerging professions in data, AI, creating content and cloud computing. To really, um, you know, enable manufacturers to stay ahead of their competition, and as a result, sixty-five percent of manufacturers are now investing in public and private cloud technologies. So this has led you know, the global pandemic. You know, has, has brought on a wave of uh, digital initiatives that have been launched, you know, or started to launch, you know, in manufacture with manufacturers across across each industry. Um, these survival tactics, I would say, though, uh, must not be confused with the real business transformation that's needed for success in this digital age we now find ourselves in. What we're going to discuss, go on to discuss here uh, today, is you know how manufacturing leaders really need to consider reimagining your manufacturing business, driving supply ecosystems and that supply chains, and and basically organization disruption and, and refocusing your teams around desired outcomes. Um, but that may, what, what that often results in is, is some main business challenges that we are seeing uh, ac across across the industry. Um, the, the changes that we're seeing is, you know, lack of control of manufacturing costs, uh, efficiencies and, and stock management. Um, controlling scrappage and waste, uh, effective resource planning, uh, and understanding and monitoring of the production processes, and an inability to pivot the market demands ahead of the competition, and having processes and systems in place to provide a 360 degree insight are starting to become more invaluable. And you know, and that's often because you know due to the fact that. 
these fragmented systems it has created uh, as a result of growth and digital transformation uh, is basically hindering uh, manufacturers and, and other businesses as well in, in order to get those in deep insights that they need to, to run a more efficient business. So we're going to look at how choosing the right ERP or manufacturing system uh, having in place will, will help you overcome the challenges with the digital revolution uh, that, that we're living in today. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Steve, who's our specialist in the manufacturing space that's going to, going, going to cover this for us. So Steve, over that's to great. you. That's great. Thanks, Johnny. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to sit through today's session. So what I want to cover off today, we'll show a bit of an example of you know what a product can look like and how that joined up view can, can, can give you a, you know, a centralized experience of, of you know, your costs and where you are within the manufacturing process. But I think linking back to, to some of the points there that Johnny's John has gone through, certainly what we've seen um, throughout the pandemic is you know a lot of businesses, I think uh, quite rightly, um, kind of shut down certain processes, uh, you know, use, utilize the furlough scheme for, for their staff. And it's interesting, we saw a number of them where actually the production didn't go down. And they were looking and thinking, well, hang on, how, how, why are we, why are we um, still operating at the same? So it's, it's actually uh, forced business owners, leaders to, to analyze, you know, some of the areas of weakness. And we've and it's not just sometimes it's looking at the whole system, but sometimes it's just looking at certain areas where perhaps the business model's changed. You're now um, trying to get items out of the warehouse a lot quicker. So utilizing technology to to rather than increase the amount of staff that you require, trying to work smarter as well. So but what I want to try and get across today really is is actually firstly kind of identifying where potentially you sit as the type of manufacturer you are, because that's that's really going to help drive the main focus from, um, from centralizing a solution. And, and often what we see customers with, with a number of disparate systems, it could be spreadsheets, it could be uh, unique, um, you know, kind of bespoke uh, solutions to handle the manufacturing process and then a separate finance solution. But actually, if you're gonna try and join up and have that single view, and there are technologies you can put in place to, to join them, but if you're gonna go for that single system, Actually, the starting point is the type of manufacturing. So really, we, we break it down into, into three standard, spoken hybrid. So standard, you can break that down into, into two areas. So are you uh, what we would class as discrete production? So a single works order or a production order. So you're, you're making the same thing over, over and over again. You know, they might have different variants of that, but essentially uh, you've got your bill of materials, you've got your structure set up, and you're just going to make those over time, complete them, and then get them out the door. Uh, you might use technologies like Backflush, so that's where you're making the order, it comes back up to the office, and essentially you just run through all of the stock allocation, picking, issuing, labour costs, etc. It just flushes it through in your, in your account system, and that's handling all of your, your costing. You might be continuous production, so 24/7. You're just adding components. It could be, you know, bottling, uh, bottling stations or something like that. But components, you're just adding components, and your finished items just kind of it's almost like a conveyor belt. You palletize them up and you get them outside of the door. So that's that's kind of the first the first part. You might be bespoke. So we've got um, a number of clients that we deal with. Example there is a, a boat boating organisation who uh, they manufacture all types of, of boats. One of the examples there was the Isle of Wight chain ferry. Now for them, whilst there are similarities in terms of the prop assembly, et cetera, but they're doing one-off design and builds. So rather than the traditional fill and materials, works order process that, that uh, you might be familiar with, for them, it's something that they need something that's more flexible, allowing them to capture the costs, the overall profitability, but just more, flex more flexible than, than the rigidity that you might see from a standard manufacturing sector. And then the final, and a lot of them would be hybrid. So actually, that's a combination of the two. So whether that is uh, one side of the business is manufacturing widgets, the other side is kind of uh, a bespoke element, or even down to we're seeing a lot more organizations where you will manufacture products but for a project and then you need to be able to install them so it's not just being able to capture uh, your costs for for the actual manufacturing element of it but also understanding what stock uh, etc you have but also being able to 
being able to see visible sorry one second there good old good old teams popping up in the corner um but also uh being able to then track where you are in the overall project so your income from uh, from customer or customers uh, costs from your works orders alongside then any installation costs any hotel costs um, as well as uh, as an internal cost to give you an overall project profitability now I tend to break down the data in your ERP system down into static your processing engine and then the output is visibility and I think they're all really important elements that you need to consider you know if you're looking to streamline those processes so static data it's it's the storing of your stock uh, stock items essentially stock is absolutely key and what we've what we see often is you've got your finance system and that's that's giving you your your accounts and you're just posting invoices but stock might be handled in in a spreadsheet you know you might have written your own bespoke uh, stock solution but actually you've got purchase orders of so what you've actually bought the stock items for but then what you've actually paid for that where they're disparate you've either got uh, a delay from uh, visibility of as the stock comes in should we be paying this not only from an accounts perspective but also um, a delay in terms of what is the stock actually costing us what are our actual stock levels and and again pulling that together often customers will be able to see a you know a far more streamlined version of that your bill of materials so if you're in the uh, standard side as we said where you're uh, or hybrid where you're, you're making the same item or variants of that item so using that structure you might want to consider then bill of materials and again we'll, we'll show you an example of what they may well look like but what you're really looking for is accuracy of of what stock you need what stock you've used uh, cost control in terms of as you purchase those items is the estimated cost for that production order is that gone up you know are the costs changing so for example uh, fabrication industry cost of steel from my understanding fluctuate so it's it's really important to keep on top of of costs are you uh, are you selling the products at a profit and then you reorder control making sure that you've got enough stock just at the right time and especially again it's, I mean, it happens all, all for all businesses cash is cash is key but certainly what we've seen over the last 12 18 months is is ensuring that you're ordering the stock just at the right time so from a cash cash flow perspective you're you're you're, uh, you're keeping yourself uh, in check there but also then uh, you've got enough stock though to cover uh, your customer orders the processing side then is key so rather than having spreadsheets to plan what you should order when you should order it um, again utilizing the technology to present that information to you now you're never going to substitute experience industry experience and knowledge but actually rather than you farming for the information having a system that's going to do that for you goods receiving so in terms of getting the items into the warehouse again what you see a lot of the time is you've got bits of paper flowing so the stock's been in the warehouse maybe for a couple of hours before your your system's been updated it's been taken for the production so actually where is your stock um, has the correct stock levels arrived and also have you got enough stock so again having that live view and utilizing technology and that's the that's the key bit now we've got we've got the ability to quite quickly and easily implement barcoding solutions uh, shop floor data capture type options to be able to clock on and clock off of operations utilizing web-based web-based technology whereas before you know it could be a 6 12 18 month type project and then your works order production order the allocation so ring fence in certain stock and then closing to give you your, your costings and then in my opinion probably the most important part is is the output it's so absolutely no point having a system where you put the data into it and you can't get at that otherwise what's the point of putting it in there so again if you think about um, uh, the slide that Johnny put up before where you've got your fragmented systems uh, you know you might have spreadsheets over here trying to pull all those reports together to give you an idea of you know what is your stock valuation uh what stock do you need to order uh what capacity have you got what orders have you got on the system at the moment again being able to present those and uh, the last one would be dashboard so actually the bespoke part of any project is how do you want that information relayed so 
having database technology where you can get to that data, perhaps put in something like Power BI, but something that's going to visualize uh, for yourselves. So what I want to do is just jump across into just to give you an idea of what this can look like in a centralized system. But I think all of this is, is transferable, you know, regardless of what solutions you're looking at. Now, first thing, as we mentioned, is, is stock control. So actually having a list of all of your stock items, what quantity of stock you've got, your sales price, but also more importantly um, than that, is actually where, where are you storing that stock? So whether that's in virtual or physical warehouses, uh, even down to where in the specific, specific locations that stock is stored, and then being able to record minimum, maximum levels. So what are the what are the levels we want to get to? So we always want to maintain a certain stocking level of the faster moving goods or items that we buy to order. Control over which suppliers that you're purchasing from. And against those suppliers then, things such as the lead time. So we know that if we buy from Copain, it's 15 day lead time. Bolster style might be slightly cheaper, but it's going to take us an extra five working days. So just having that visibility alongside list prices, you might even have quantity breaks. So I need to order 50. Well, actually, if we ordered 60, we can get it for a slightly cheaper price. So having all of that information visible and even down to do you have to order in multiples of an item? From a, uh, from a barcoding, so if you wanted to deploy in for your warehousing, even down to the system will recognize that supplier's barcode. And then other things such as, if we've got economical batch sizes. So do we need to, for any sub-assemblies, rather than the customer wants 50, so we're gonna set the machine and do all the tooling for 50, actually it makes no sense. We, we you know, if we're gonna do that, we wanna do a run of 500. So we'll book 450 into stock, which we can use elsewhere because it just makes more efficient use of our time. And then things down to, um, in terms of when you're looking at the bigger picture, do we want to be able to um, just group suggestions? So rather than ordering just in time, let's just kind of order, order a week's worth ahead of the time. So different, different sort of settings, but again, this is your static data. So once you've got that set up, systems and then going to pull from this if you're the type of business as i said that's going to be using bill of materials things to consider there then would be um how many levels sub assemblies again often what we see is it could be too complex now i believe i think the boeing 747 i'm sure it's the 747 was built over seven levels uh you know we do go into some sites where there could be 12 levels of, of, of a um, the bill of materials actually do you really need it that complex but then what components do you need, you know, in terms of units of measure, what items would you need to be able to build this, which is then going to translate into costing. But not only that, what's the routing that you need to go through? So for, um, for this example here, we've got, from a resources perspective, labor, you could have machine time as well. You know, do we have to, uh, is there a fixed, fixed length? So as you set the machine up, so the system then taking that uh, information and presenting that so you're able to track where you are in that production cycle as well as move those individual operations around handling subcontract so often we see from a subcontract perspective there's no visibility of what you've sent out what you've got back unless it's in somebody's spreadsheet um, but also the costing you know it's great we've got a purchase order in in there for 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 a subcontractor but actually what um what has it really cost us and as I mentioned, just bringing it back to the costing over time, just rerunning this costing for, for various different bill of materials, just to see, have we got the calculated cost? Is that changing? Should we be uh, changing the uh, the selling price as well? So once you've once you've uh, got that got that sort of static data, it's then the processing element. So as I said earlier, you might be at the moment handling this in uh, in a separate system. You might have a T card system on on the board. Actually, having that single view in its real time in terms of as is updated. So whether you're the type of organization who makes to makes to order. So you put a sales order on the system, a customer order, you wanna generate a, uh, um, a works order or production order, as you might call it off the back of that. But actually then being able to see, so good old blue, to, blue, blue Peter fashion, here's one I prepared earlier, whereby we can see there's the item the customer wants, 
we haven't got any in stock, so we need to make it. But actually, we've got this pre-allocation. So again, using technology. So I've got a works order that's been set up on the system that is pre-allocated to this order. So when we finish and um, have built it, it will automatically allocate. So we've ring-fenced that unique order. But also for the sales team being able to see where you are in terms of the status of that particular order itself. You might be the type of organization who doesn't want to do it as a workflow. You want a bit more control. So actually you can give the production team control of being able to choose what works orders you want to create. So again, linked to the appropriate sales order. Again, you might be hybrid. You might do a combination of make to stock and make to order. So don't worry about either of those. It might be that you run material planning and the system is then suggesting what works orders you need to place, the quantity that you need to make, where, which of your factories or your warehouses that you need to make it, when should you start that in order to be able to get it completed in time for your customer. So working backwards, the customer doesn't want it till next Friday. It's a two day lead time. So get it uh, finished the day before. So start it on the, start it on the Tuesday, for example. And then being able to see the reasons why, for example, that we, uh, that we might, that we might be needing to make this particular item. So as you double click, we've having things like minimum stock level set up. So in order to make this, we always want a float of 20, uh, 20 in stock. But currently we're below that at five. So suggesting making another 15 to bring you that, to that, that, uh, that balance. But it might be you've got customer orders in there or even forecasts, but we'll come back to this shortly. So what does that works order look like and why why would you go down that route? You know, why why is this why is this better than your spreadsheets? Well, first things first, if we come down and have a look at look at what the production order is, all I've done is taken a snapshot of the original bill of materials and I've dropped the components in. We can see any operations within there and how far through the operations we are. So currently somebody's been working on that, we've completed one of the ten. Being able to see from a materials perspective, actually, have you got enough free stock? Or well, if you haven't got enough free stock, could we create a purchase order for that from the preferred supplier or pick a supplier at this stage? Or alternatively, I could use material planning to pick that particular item up. Not only that, centralized costing. Because you're buying stock into, and your stock, your invoicing, your finance system is all in one area, giving you an idea of what the cost should be. So in this case, it's using the average price, but as we then consume that stock using the costing method, so you've got an actual cost of what this is, um, has cost you in order to be able to produce this, this particular order. Flexibility of being able to drill down to any sub-assemblies if necessary, swap items out, even down to remove and add and make this unique for that particular customer's order. So perhaps, um, Rather than uh, use blue leather, we want uh, we want a nice uh, blue suede for, for for this particular fabric order, that sort of thing. Non-stock items. So again, you don't want to stock it; it's pointless. But bubble wrap, anything like that, even down to um, you might buy, you know, you might uh, buy an engine in that's bespoke for each build. Rather than keep setting them up as stock items, just have it as a free text, but you're including the cost in that overall build. Visibility of your labor, so your estimated labor costs based on an average, but then who's actually worked on that? So you've got accountability as people clock on. And there's a number of ways that we can do that. The first one is you could just use manual timesheets. Alternatively, we can print off a root card. Just minimize that there. Put on my spooler. We've actually got a got a root card here for a specific works order and then utilizing technology. So if I just bring up this particular screen here, an Android app that's connected to Sage by a web API connector. So over the internet today, in today's example, we've got the shop floor. So it's an Android app. Uh, it could be um, a Samsung tablet, for example, but any kind of Android device. As a user, I can clock in, recognizes me, and I could tap on the screen, get away with paper completely. I could scan the barcode. So if I scan this unique barcode here, being able to then see the details, any notes for that particular 
operation. And if I click on start, are there any supplementary machine times? And actually my activity started. I can now log out and I can start to work on that particular that particular production run. This bit of paper can follow me around with, with any notes and you can have multiple operation sub-assemblies, but, but actually what that's doing then is capturing, if I go back through and I just refresh this a second, it's now Steve Gemmett has now clocked on, we can see here, I haven't got any actual cost because I've not completed the operation, but again, utilizing technology. So rather than your, your pieces of paper for your timesheets and then trying to work out uh, as a rough example, utilizing that technology very quick, most people can use apps this day and age to be able to capture that information. Things like subcontract. So being able to have subcontract operations uh, generate an operation at some stage. So where the subcontract is, uh, we're going to send these items out to uh, for powder coating, shot blast, or whatever that would be. But being able to generate a purchase order. For the items, so we'll just put a notional price in there for those ones at the moment. When do I need it? Well, I'll have it in for Monday. Generating, there's a purchase order in Sage 200. So that's now sat there. And if I save this for a moment, our estimated cost now has gone up as we've got a cost for the subcontract entry. But more importantly, being able to track what have we sent out to the suppliers? So being able to dispatch. Ah, so I've already, I've already allocated my lines, but being able to dispatch these items out and then receive them back in as well. So being able to control where those items are, as well as then the actual cost. Things like booking multiple finished items into stock or changing over here. So, you know, if you're in the type of industry where, depending on the ambient temperature, you might get a greater or lesser yield. So being able to edit the finished quantity amount. So has it cost more or less per unit? So just giving you that flexibility centrally. So as you complete the works order, you've got that actual cost. And under the costing summary over here, being able to then see your original budget versus what it's actually costing you. Even down to things, if you wanted to do it as a proof of concept, what should I be selling these at if I wanna make a 20% margin? So that's the first kind of part of it is you've got your static data. So you've got who you're buying it from, uh, your, your costing, you've got uh, the history of all of the stock movements, so giving you your average average buy price using you know whatever costing method you've got set up as you issue the components. So having that control, of course, we need to we need to order some stock as well potentially. So as I say, we can we can do so. Create purchase orders. I'll do that. We'll we'll buy those from uh, BGT. I'll do today. And if I create my purchase order, there it is. There, thirty-eight twenty-six. Now. That's great. Rather than somebody having to key that now into, into another system, we've got a nice pre-allocation here. So we know we've bought those specifically for this particular order. So if we come into purchase order processing, we can see our list. Traditionally, what would happen is you would you would uh, wait for that to come in and a bit of paper to come up to, to the organization to be able to receive that in. Now, if I just have a quick view of this particular order, we can see that it's dropped, dropped the details on there, and I'm able to see which warehouse that, is, that has come into. Had I generated this from material planning visibility of how we've, how we've bought that. But actually now, what the warehouse can do is they can update the system without a need for me to pass those bits of paper. So again, using Android technology linked to it, pick up a device, be able to log in, it recognizes me over the internet, log into the appropriate warehouse, come to receive my purchase orders. Let's find, find my PO, wherever, oops, sorry, not that one, wherever the PO is that I've just put on. Let's have a quick look. I, don't know, I can't see it on there, but uh, being able to uh, see the items, scan them in, but also see those pre-allocations, so, so what works order is it pre-allocated to, and then be able to good receive those items back into stock. Even down to things such as being able to move stock around the warehouse, move stock between warehouses, 
do your stock take as well quick, quickly and easily just from the utilizing the technology um, even down to scanning a stock item and then seeing where else we've got stock in the warehouse or what purchase orders we've got on the system to be able to buy in so that centralized view all of a sudden your organization is working smarter is working quicker but not only that for your sales orders being able to also see what orders we need to get out the door and because this is utilizing that single database when we as we spoke about with the dashboards being able to present that on the wall see how many orders we've got to get out today how far through are we now talking about visibility you've got rough cut capacity planning so being able to see what orders you've got scheduled so we mentioned the t card systems that you might have in place or you might be using spreadsheets for this type of information so at the header level based on what resources you have and work patterns and what you've got scheduled what labor demand versus labor availability machine etc as well looking at individual teams and being able to see what you've got scheduled versus have we got enough capacity just at a, at a high level looking at what you've scheduled for individual employees Perhaps just more of a list view as well being able to see what's due this week what's due for future weeks as well what's overdue and based on the time that you've used so far and what's remaining how much time do we need in order to be able to catch up on that back on that backlog and then more of a diary view so from a works order perspective just a, a nice visual as to what works orders have we got scheduled on the system so being able to see see those orders and if we want to being able to move them move them around and that actually updating your live system rather than again updating your spreadsheet then log into what other systems you've got to to, to do this so giving you that centralized view even down to from an operations perspective being able to pick certain certain orders so if we just pick this order here being able to see what operations we've got set up and as we move those operations if there's any subsequent ones does, is that going to affect and changing your, your system live so being able to manipulate that data based on what you've actually got on the system coming back to the material planning side of things here as we said when you run this not only telling you what you should order what purchase orders you should order but any warnings have we got works orders that are overdue have we got any purchase orders that are overdue so rather than you having to make diary notes being able to being able to have an idea of what the system's pushing that to as opposed to you have to run that even down to things like we've got a works order on the system we need to buy some stock in but it's telling us it may not arrive in time because the, the, the static data you set up is uh, is presenting that for you you might suggested stock transfers so if you need to replenish other other warehouse locations what stock do you need to transfer in order from the main warehouse to replenish that perhaps your type of organization that has uh, batch traceability so showing you where your expiry dates are are over in this case very overdue although i'm sure that would still be fine uh it's frozen but you've uh, you've got you know whether the 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 sell by or the use by dates are getting close so giving you visibility rather than having to you know um hold this in other other areas and then your purchase orders so when should you place the po when do we need it to arrive the stock item details how many is the system suggesting we order but you can override those as well so it is just a suggestion as i say it might be you look at it and go we've never ordered that many what on earth what on earth's going on so we can go to the end and actually have a quick look at why on earth the system suggesting that many and actually we can see we've got a good level of free stock i can see we've got some works orders here requiring that that are on the system we've actually got a suggested works order from the other tab over here that needs 450,000. So the system is actually suggesting, look, we need to, to cover all of this, we need to order further 436,262 to bring us back to our baseline. So again, just presenting that to you, but you could you could choose not to buy that many this time. You've got your preferred supplier, but being able to pick alternate suppliers and then your, your prices as well. And then, as I said, in terms of the various different reasons why the system suggesting that you order that many so in this instance we've got a minimum stock level of 10 
it's a next day delivery. So if we place the order today, the earliest we can get it would be tomorrow. Current free stock zero is below our minimum. We've also got a work order that requires that. Now, if I've got permission, let's just double click and let's open up the works order. Let's have a, let's have a quick look at the details of that particular works order. Let's have a look who's it for, um, perhaps drill up to the sales order if that was relevant. And then it's suggesting we order 46, bring the balance back to 10. So because all of that's in the single system, you've set up your static data correctly. Again, it's just making your lives easier. And then the final final piece then is you've got your works orders. And once you've, uh, let me just remove that because we, we don't need that. Once you've um, issued your, your components, so you can allocate which ring fence issue, moves all the costs into WIP. Once all that's done, and perhaps we've we've got our our labour costs. Well, actually, what I want to do is just clock back into my uh, shop floor. So if I come back into the shop floor, I've finished my operation. I can just click on user activity, and I can now say, okay, I'm going to stop. Am I going for lunch? Have I finished for the day, but not that finished? Or have I fully complete? And if I fully complete that, that's now confirmed there's no other operations and I could leave the building so you know, there's options to be able to track who's in the building but as I log out and I refresh this what we can now see wait for that just refresh what we can now see is I've made nine that time so we can track who's been working on what quantities how long I actually spent and then my actual cost based on my on my cost rate and all of that again rolling up into the finished item. What I can then do is I can book my finished item into stock. Once I'm happy with all that, I'm going to go book. Do I want to track any stock? The moment I book that in, it's pre allocated to our sale 54.94. And now if I go to my sales order list, we look at the top here and as I refresh, we can now see that's fully allocated. And that's ready for us to pick and dispatch. And if I just go into the go into the order, we can see there it is allocated. They're ready to pick, and they're ready to go from the appropriate warehouse. So in this case, factory. So they're going to go from the factory. So if on my uh, barcoding this time, I'm just uh, I will share the screen in just a second. I'm just going to change, change my warehouse. So it's 54.94. If I bring up barcoding, that's automatic release to the warehouse. You can print bits of paper, but it just appears on their list ready for them to pick and dispatch. It's going to load up some details in terms of who, who the customer is. It tells me where to go in the warehouse to go and pick it. I can scan barcodes. Can enter the quantities and as I pick that particular item and I can pack it again you've got live visibility here in terms of parts have been picked but not yet packed and we can also see the orders currently being picked by Steve so we can start to see the status even down to the quantity that's been picked and those can appear then on those dashboards that we were talking about the next option is I could put this into boxes if I wanted to, so different different boxes. Or if I dispatch and I say yes, what that's doing is back just in the system here. As soon as the as soon as it's finished from there, as I refresh, that's been dispatched and now that's ready for invoicing. So again, from a streamlined perspective, we're just using technology here. As I say, this is just an example, just of a way that you can you can utilize this to uh, to remove those fragmented systems, shorten lead times. So we've been working with Sage on a case study for a, a customer, which should be released very soon, if not if it's not already been released, where they've they had a, an average or rough uh, lead time of about five weeks that they would give to customers to now a guaranteed five days, and that's just using this technology. So not only are they able to be more efficient, but they're all, or also able to take on more orders, which is you know, and cover those, but utilizing the same amount of resources, as well as then 
that centralized cost control. So just bringing it back to the, uh, the spreadsheet. So just want to just cover off, if we go back just a couple of slides, you know, in terms of these were the results that Johnny mentioned there. So things such as stock management issues. Well, again, we've, we've covered that off by having your static data set, utilizing technology. So if the warehouse are able to move stock around and that's updating your system in real time using that barcoding technology, then you've got more chance of your stock being correct. Yes, you've got the human impact. That's never going to never going to go away, but it's trying to minimize or mitigate as much of that risk. Lack of cost control. Well, because you're buying your stock in inside of that finance solution from a costing perspective, it's then using that real time costing information as you start to build your production orders. So from a cost control, being able to see what's in WIP, be able to run reports on that. Where are we from a costing perspective with all of the works orders on? Visibility around resource management and planning. So again, being able to see at a rough level, are we over under capacity over the next however many weeks? What orders have we got in? What can we move around? But again, rather than doing that in a spreadsheet and then having to repeat the work, you're doing it there and then in a live environment. We spoke about the lead times. So because you're able to see what stock you've got at that point in time, could we make could we make this? We can see what capacity we've got, being able to then give better lead times to your customers. And, and all of that is by reducing the fragmentation of the systems and pulling it all central. So I appreciate it's a lot to go through, but as I said, what we see often is, you know, a lot of customers coming in in different, different areas, some have already got the systems in place. It's just they're looking for something to be a bit more efficient, a bit more modern. Uh, others where, you know, the business quite successfully has evolved using various different uh, platforms. But now it's just, you, you know, you might recognize some of these challenges. So as we went through, definitely in that instance, think about the type of manufacturer you are. Uh, obviously, we didn't cover bespoke today, but use or hybrid with projects and that. But Again, that's really going to help drive the direction that you utilize the system rather than buying a system and not using it because it's not working for you. And then finding and making sure that you've got good quality of static data. You understand how you're going to process that data and the various different elements and the roles and responsibilities across the organization. And the visibility output, not covered dashboards today, that's the bespoke element, but whether you want to use Excel, Power BI, whether it's um, other sort of uh, reporting type technologies, so long as the data is in the system, which is covered by the two above, then that can be presented, you know, because it's all coming uh, quite logically from a single single source. So, Johnny, I guess it's over to yourself. If we um, if we had any questions at all. Uh, let me just check the uh, question box here. Uh, Steve, um, question here, you know, what's a typical customer um, look like? Um, I guess all the questions here. Do you know what? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, do you know what? I, I don't think there is a typical, typical customer. Um, as I said, they come, you often, you often, um, see similarities as you as you as you're talking to to different organizations but those similarities all come back to you know the slide that we had up earlier where you know we're trying to streamline you know there, there's there's often a decision as to should we recruit more people or should we invest in software you know that's often often a um often often a challenge and it's it, it, there will be times where you have to recruit, you know, um, just because of the very nature of it. But, but yeah, off, as I said earlier, we've, we've seen a lot of clients where they've reduced the workforce, you know, because of utilizing the furlough scheme, but because they've, they've got the right technologies in place, production hasn't actually been, been affected. So as those people come back, they've been able to deploy them um, far more effectively and, and, and grow the business without any further further um, personnel investment. But yeah, in terms of a typical customer, I guess it's somebody who who has got to a point where they're, yeah, they're at that crossroad, as I said, you know, in terms of do we recruit more people or do we, do we invest in software? 
they're struggling to have visibility of costs to be able to work out you know, are they making a profit on or whether it's a project or on each individual production build um, a company who who is willing to to look you know look at different approaches you know i think would be would be a, a typical you know you, you've got to be aware that you're you're um you know and willing that you you, you want to change and um but yeah whether whether they're already on an erp solution and just looking at something different or whether just starting off you know yeah for me there's there's no typical it's it's, it's having those individual conversations um you know to find out what blends you know where we may or may not be able to help thanks steve agreed with that um another question here um it's a question about um, implementation steve so maybe talk about about what implementation looks like you know sh should it be a, a big bang or you know should we phase it in um again it depends on where you are as a business um i would always my my default route would always be phase it in the reason being is you've got day jobs now if you could pause stop production you know press press that pause button free up all the resource to focus on a project fantastic but there is a reality um you know as you say you've, you've got the day job so where possible i would always say phase it in because it gives you a bit of time don't try to rush a project either but there are certain circumstances it might be that uh, your contracts come to an end with your current system and you've got a decision as to whether to renew or not sometimes there you've got to try and spend a lot of plates to get the product in place but you need to go into that with your eyes open uh, as to you know to ensure that you're going to have to make sure you can reallocate the right personnel to go through training etc time scales that often is often a question of how much time should we should we factor for for, for this journey again i'd break that up into um pre-sales implementation and then go live from the pre-sales side you know selecting the right supplier you know i would don't rush that process you know again uh, it always looks at the features so have a have a clear list of your must-haves your nice-to-haves often i would say drop that into a spreadsheet you know that makes everybody's lives easier these are some of the key, key things that we need sit through some demonstrations have a look at have a look at the software you want to work with a uh, with a partner as well who who you feel is going to understand you get to know you it is a relationship at the end of the day that you're signing into not just purchasing some software so make sure you're comfortable with that so in terms of that process give yourself give yourself plenty of time to uh, to make that decision when you get into the implementation so from from kind of signing the project i would say it depends if you're already on on sage or sage product you know there's there's migration options there if you're coming from a completely different um, finance solution you need to factor that in but again give yourself sort of six six nine months for a project now that's not every day doing the same thing but that's giving you time to collate your data have a play alongside your day job now it can be done quicker if you've got dedicated personnel but again don't don't be afraid to um to factor in a bit more time and then go live once you go live with a system doesn't mean all of a sudden that the support goes away and you're you're good to go there will always be there'll be ebbs and flows in a project so you know on the go live it again it's that relationship with the partner to be able to phone up get support uh revisit some, some items but it shouldn't be too much if you factored the time in for for uh for testing and that's the final thing i would say any anything whether it's taking a phased approach or whether you're going big bang testing absolutely you know the one thing that often you see where a project could go wrong is just making sure you are testing uh, and doing some testing there shouldn't really be any surprises when you go live um, and then the final thing is it's a silly phrase i like to use um, you don't know what you don't know until you need to know it and i know it sounds it sounds a bit silly but coming into this you 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 won't have all the answers you know and again that's where you you know you're finding a partner that you have the experience you know and, and those experiences and as, as johnny put up earlier you know from an acorn perspective over over 400 um sage implementations there's a lot of experience taken from those in terms of you know what customers have done well what they haven't done so you know that's very much going into going into the pot there but but 
you know, even down to well, how should we structure our static data? How should we structure our bombs? Well, you know, there's the support there. Start with just a couple, and you'll start to very quickly build up that picture. Great, Steve. I think we've uh, time for one last question. Just going through, try and pick out a good one here. Uh, here's a good one. Um, what about a typical return on investment, Steve, um, for for a project such as this? What what does that look like? It's <laughs> a hard, it's a hard <laughs> question. Not many intangibles, isn't there? Yeah, do you know, it's, it's a great question. I'll be personally, pers uh, perfectly frank, I've never been a big fan of return on investments because they, um, if you're not careful, they can be really biased. You know, um, you see it a lot with, at the moment I'm looking at electric vehicles, we're moving everything electric and, you know, you see all these stats and stuff and then there's this actually what happens in the real world. But in terms of, I suppose, what the areas for that return on investment, uh, which you could focus on if you wanted to you know if we take the barcoding and warehousing side of things you know it's 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 looking and every organization will be different but you know um what's the cost to the business for somebody picking and dispatching the wrong items you know what's the what's the cost on the business for items that perhaps are batch or serial traceable that might spoil you know if, if you're not sending out the right items you know that could sometimes that can be um that can be a cost that you need to factor in. Of course, you've got your labor costs. So if looking at this, as we said earlier, do we invest or do we buy? Well, if you're saying it's gonna save you two people, that's a fairly simple calculation. But I think I think it really depends on, on um, the type of industry you are and, and what, what your journey point is. But as I say, from my perspective, it's, there should be, there should be, um, an improvement there should be a reduction in admin there should be uh an improvement in mi and that if there isn't then then it's the wrong system but i'll actually flip that around to you johnny i mean you've you've worked in a multitude of um sectors over the years what's your what's your viewpoint on um sort of return on investments it's pretty much the same as yours steve you know it's it's nothing intangible you know it's 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 looking at the, the time uh, and efficiency gains that you're getting from put, uh, you know, from getting an order into putting a product at the door. Uh, if you can do that quicker and sell more uh, of your product, then uh, that, that's that's a good return. Do you know, I think that's a great point. The case study we were talking about, where you know, reduced from a a rough estimate of five weeks, I think it was maybe six weeks to a guaranteed five days. Yeah, you know, as you say, from a calculation, you know, you could you could drop it into an Excel screen and calculate, but you know, say often, I mean, I used to produce return on investments in, uh, worked in the enterprise HR payroll sector, which is why I kind of say for me, it's, you know, it's like anything you can make figures fit, but, but yeah, what I would often do is, is actually, I'd fo you know, focus on, you know, the benefits, making sure sort of the areas, because actually the rest of it kind of takes care of itself. But, but yeah, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you know, to sit down and try and work something out with with, with customers, it's sort of, sort of something we could do. But yeah, I think um, it should be inevitable that uh, that it's going to give you savings if it's you know if you're selecting the right solution, you're you know you're dropping in the right technologies for for your organisation. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, Steve. I just want to you know wrap this up, Steve. There's a couple of slides left here. You know, just to wrap this up, there. If you're considering you know, uh, you know, any kind of system to, uh, you know, help you em embrace digital technologies, you know, whether you're based in the south of Ireland or the north, there is support available out there from the different enterprise agencies. I know Invest and I run on some schemes at the moment, uh, and, and Enterprise Ireland as well. Uh, in terms of the next steps, uh, what we would suggest, reach out, let's have a chat, let's discuss some of your, some of your objectives, on a Facebook demo to yourself, uh, to yourselves, uh, or you know, if you want to debate on the sub certain subjects, <laughs> you know, we're 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 open to hearing your ideas as well. Uh, but yep, I, I suggest what we'll do is send this recording around. Everybody who wants to review it, share it with our team, share it with our leadership, and yeah, we'll look forward to to hearing from you soon. And we're very grateful that you came on to uh, spend some time with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.